All right. Good morning, everyone. This is B-Sides Las Vegas. This is the I Am The Cavalry tra track. And this is Hacking the Pentagon, How a Rebel Alliance Shifts Culture to Protect National Security. And we have uh, Brett and Harlan talking today. A uh, couple quick announcements. Uh, if you could go ahead and hold your questions till the end of the talk, we'll go ahead and pass the microphone around to you and make sure that you are able to be heard online when you ask your question. So just raise your hand and we'll come to you. Uh, please go ahead and silence your cell phones now. Again, we are streaming online, so we really appreciate if you go ahead and silence your phones now so they're not interrupting the speaker. Um, we'd like to thank our sponsors, especially our inner circle sponsors, which are Critical Stack and Valley Mail, um, and our stellar sponsors. Uh, that includes Silence, Microsoft, and Robinhood, just to name a few. Um, their support, along with our other sponsors, donors, and the volunteers, they make this event possible, and we really appreciate all of them. Um, and if you have any questions, again, please hold them till the end. And without further ado, thank you very much. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Brett Goldstein. I'm the director of the Defense Digital Service, and I work at the Pentagon, and now I'm in Vegas. So thanks for having me. Um, this is my friend Harlan. He's an engineer on our team, and we're going to tell you a whole bunch of stuff over the next hour. So it's a story that will essentially have three parts. I'm going to give you my background. It's kind of weird and sort of like hopefully that will be sort of morning fun. And then I'm going to talk about DDS and why we aren't what you think we are and how it's completely weird that we are in the middle of the Pentagon. Um, <clears throat> and then three, Harlan's going to walk through some projects, which are pretty cool. So thanks for coming. So, you know, let me sort of start and be like, you know how in life there's certain things you just know? Like, like to be honest with you, I know I will be a Red Sox fan forever, okay? So that's a given, that's how we roll up there. Um, there are also other things that I, I thought I knew. One was I would never move to Washington, D.C., okay? So I knew that, right? Two, I'd never be a full-time federal employee, okay? Those are two really important things. and. Well, I'm still a Red Sox fan, so and that part's going for me. Now, okay, so where do we start? So where do I come from? I'm a computer scientist, right? I was one of, people know OpenTable? Yep, so I was one of the dudes who built that. So in the late 90s, we are a bunch of idiots in the basement, and we thought that there was a better way to do that, and we went up against the restaurant industry, right? And we wrote horrible software, and all the maitre d's out there hated us. Like, it was like, we have our big reservation book, and it's amazing. And I'm like, there's this thing called the computer, and that could be really amazing as well. Um, so I spent seven years of my life building that company. And so along the way, 9-11 um, happened. And, <clears throat> you know, OpenTable had been going for a couple of years at that point, and I was traveling on 9-11. And so I was evacuated off a plane, I was in the terminal watching the tower go down, and it was just, it was horrific to me. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, so I'm helping rich people make dinner reservations, and I'm watching people do some really important things on the screen. So on my way home, because, you know, for those of you that remember, the flights were grounded for a while, so I just gave up. I went home to my wife, and, you know, I'm like, when I'm done with this open table nonsense, I need to do something that's more meaningful. So, okay, so what is that? So originally my plan was I was gonna do volunteer work, right? Um, I was in Chicago, and it's, if you haven't heard, Chicago's a little chilly in the winter, um, and I was gonna go do checks on folks and do that, and that was gonna scratch the edge. But then a couple of years later, there was an article in the New York Times, and the New York Times talked about how big city police departments were recruiting white collar professionals to do work in the counterterrorism space. And I'm like, oh, I'm a white collar professional. Maybe I can do something that would be impactful. So, you know, along came the Chicago police exam and I really like to take tests. And so, so I went and I'm like, okay, the test is gonna be fun. So I got to go to this big stadium at the United Center. Anyone here from Chicago? Okay, well, I guess, okay, we got one. Um, so you know the United Center. I go to the United Center and I'm with like 14,000 people and I take a test and I did really well on the test and that was great. And I'm like, okay, so, 
And over the next couple of years, I continued to take these tests, right? You go and you take a physical test. I learned how to do sit-ups. Those were exciting. Um, you, you know, go for a little run in a circle. I took a psych test. I had a medical exam. They did a background uh, check on me where they came and they're like, do you really want to be the police? I'm like, yeah, it was in the New York Times. Um, and uh, they're like, oh, New York Times, great. Uh, so, you know, after, at this point, OpenTable is a multinational. Like I'd been opening markets and we built it and the data center was great and everything was wonderful. And, um, you know, I get this letter. It said, report to the Chicago Police Academy. And I'm like, in two weeks. I'm like, okay. So that seemed, so I'm like, it's time for me to get out of open table and then um, do something that has some meaning. So I actually went to the police academy. So I went in as a 31 year old recruit. And so 31 is important because I was 10 years older than everyone in the recruit class. And they had actually been, so I'd figured out that whole sit up thing. Eh, they're big on push ups. And that was something that was new to me. And that 10 year thing made it fun. So I have great cop stories. I spent six years in the academy. I got out and then um, I was a valedictorian, which meant I got to pick where I got sent. Remember, I'm good at tests. Um, and I went and I worked on the west side of Chicago. For those of you that don't know Chicago, there are two areas which are unfortunately the most violent, the west and the south side of Chicago. And then I learned about the real world. And I spent um, my first year and a bit as a beat cop out there and then um, you know, there's just so much I learned about the challenges that are out there. And then overnight, the department, I guess their old computer caught up and it said graduate degree in computer science. Um, you, you know, the whole open table nonsense and all that, I got transferred overnight back to headquarters and the chief of police assigned me to use data and ML to better identify where and when homicides would occur. So I went from being a beat cop to my secret was outed. So I spent the next four years um, developing techniques to identify where and when homicide would occur in Chicago. I lived and breathed that. How do we every day prevent where violence would occur? Part of it was computer science and data science, but part of it was we would actually go on the field with interdiction units to prevent people from being killed. And this was one of those fascinating things where, um, you know, everyone said you can't change a big bureaucracy. And you know, CPD has been doing it this way for 100 years. They'll never change. But you know what? When you have an opportunity to make a business smarter and change the way they're doing it, and your measurement is how many lives you save, you go up against the machine. And so I lived and breathed. All I did was homicide for a while. Okay. I, I got out of government after, you know, I did, well, it ended up being seven years. I said five years. Separate story, I was in the private sector for a while in academia and financial services. And then I was so done with government. My family had moved to northern Wisconsin, middle of nowhere. Key point, homicide rate is zero. And that was really, really nice because I needed a timeout from homicide. So a year ago, <clears throat> I'm, you know, I'm just doing my thing. And I get this note and it's like, can you come over to the Pentagon? And I'm like, huh? like the Pentagon, I'm like, all right, that's in DC, never been there, don't know how to get there, but I'm like, who turns down going to the Pentagon? So I come over to the Pentagon and, um, you, you know, they're like, you need to leave your devices outside. I'm like, why would I do that? Because um, I don't know anything. Um, so I leave my devices outside and then um, they're like, can you be a special advisor to the DOD on technology and data science and stuff like that? So over the past, uh, for a year, I was this part-time advisor where I had this completely normal life. And I started to get involved in um, everything from working with OPNAV in the Navy to um, the Marines to I actually went to Afghanistan. Now, uh, keep in mind, you know, my background was Chicago and Open Table and Silicon Valley and academia. And then I'm on a Black Hawk in Afghanistan. That is not an experience I ever thought I would have. And then a few months ago, I started to learn about this team, the Defense Digital Service. Okay? And I didn't know that they even existed. Um, and I'm going through the Pentagon, I have to do a briefing, and um, 
you know, the Pentagon's kind of a formal place. You go in, how, how many people, like I like to ask questions, how many people have been to the Pentagon? Okay, so you probably see a lot of people that look like how I'm dressed now, right? No, no, they're, they're in uniforms and they're in suits and ties and like serious ties, not play ties. And, um, and then it's very, like people walk very appropriately and it's, it's, it's you know, it's that whole bit. And um, I'm going there and I was catching up with my friend Chris Lynch, who I know, knew from, I was on the board of Code for America for a number of years. And so Chris runs this defense digital service thing and I'm like, what is this? Because I'm in the Pentagon and I'm like, I'm giving people advice, but I'm like, we need to raise the bar. We need the best in technology. How do we solve problems? Because at the end of the day, what, what do I care about in the space? The technology should never get in the way of the mission of national defense. And how do we get, like, I found it completely enlightening. I'm like, how is it that I have the very best that I'm seeing out in Silicon Valley, but I'm not seeing the very best when I'm at DOD? And that just irks me because at the end of the day, the criticality of that is important. So, you know, Chris comes, uh, you, you know, I meet him and then we go into this office and there's this sign that says Rebel Alliance. And I'm like, huh, what unit is Rebel Alliance? Um, and I walk in and it was like walking into Silicon Valley. And it turns out that we have this bastion of talent at the Defense Digital Service that, um, we bring in some of the very best, and we're gonna be talking about that. Um, but what's fascinating about this, and so, all right, I guess we should tell the end of the story. Um, a few months ago, Chris had decided that it was time to move on to his next gig, and the Secretary of Defense asked me to take that over. So guess, this was the first time I'd ever seen a job in DC, which would get me, remember, Northern Wisconsin, zero homicide, three small children, like, move everyone to the DC and go back to, I am now gonna be a, a full-time federal employee. So let me tell you about the Defense Digital Service because we're part of USDS, many of you may know that. Um, it, when USDS came out of the healthcare.gov, interesting activities. Um, but what do we care about? We care about work that matters. Now, okay, this is a lovely chart. So. One of the things when you go into government and you go into places like the DOD, you sometimes realize that the technical bar may not be as high as you might hope. Now, we came across this diagram, which is part of a textbook, people. So how can we have excellence in technology if this is a type of supporting material that you have? The bar needs to be raised. So the Defense Digital Service, so let's talk about what it is. So I have about 70 folks. Harlan's one of them, I'm another one of them. About 40 of them are civilians, about 30 of them are active duty folks. And the civilians come from like all the places you'd know. And they're people who say, I have expertise. I am like Harlan's an engineer, or I'm a product person, I'm a designer, I'm a security engineer and I want to serve. And what do we do? We bring people in on a two-year appointment. It's a two-year tour of duty. You have the ability to extend for an additional two years, and you come in and you work on things that you can't even imagine. They're all over the spectrum. And then what we do, because I think it is critical that we also have active duty folks in. So those are folks in uniform, people who are you know, out in whatever service it is, and they bring a couple things to the table. One, there are um, there's amazing talent in the surface uh, in the services. Like you have people who have gone out and they have learned how to code, they have learned how to architect, they've done all this, and they're sitting there at night and they're like, "I'm learning all this stuff. What do I do with it? How do I grow? How do I get better?" Um, and those are folks we're always looking for. And then you have other folks who have been trained by the services and they have the bones. And how do we make them better? How do we give them the right mentor? Like how many of us in the room, the reason we've grown is because we have the right people teaching us. Like if I didn't have the right mentors, I'd be, I don't know, I, I don't have a good answer to that. It's because I learned really well from folks. 
So we've put together this team um, who are people you wouldn't expect coming out of the civilian sector who have said, I want to do something different. Or we have people coming out of the services who are looking to grow and looking to work on a mission. And the, the core sort of types of projects that we do. Um, so one, we're firefighters, okay? At the end of the day, the Defense Digital Service, if there is a technical heater which is just absolutely horrific, we are going to be the people you call. Because I will say all day long that my team has the very best in technical talent anywhere in the DOD. My folks are amazing and they can solve problems, and they will go wheels up in hours to anywhere in the world to fix a problem. And that is amazing. Um, two, we will advise on projects. So say there is a big enterprise initiative. Um, we're the best in technical advisors. There are really stupid ways to do procurements, and we could pick the worst in tech. So if you don't put the nerds in the room, how are we ever going to do this right? Like for those of you that sort of have some history here, you know, you go back to when did we like the, the idea of having security in the boardroom? Like there was a day long before that. I remember in the early days of Open Table having to sit down with the board and justify cybersecurity expenditures. And they're like, why would we spend on that? I'd be like, oh, because this nonsense is going to be hacked, yo. Um, and, <laughs> you, you know, but the world has changed. So how can we do massive procurements without having that expertise in the room? Then there are things that are more mission related. So as I mentioned, I've been in Afghanistan three times. We're working on a project for force protection there. So we go wheels up, we go into combat zones. It's a voluntary activity for the team. I've done three over and it's, it's one of those things where you work on, like I've worked on a lot of projects, but it's the type of projects that you go to bed at night and you're like, I made a difference. Because what are the types of themes here? One, we do things to make active service on folks' life better. Great example is a project called Move.mil. Like every few years, service folks have to change their station. It is from a technology perspective, an absolute nightmare. Why would you do that to them? That's, that feels awfully rude. So we intervened and we've made that better. Or two, how do we save our folks' lives? What can we do to save lives? That's this type of stuff that helps me sleep. And that's the type of stuff that the team works on. Now, what architecturally makes us super unique is who's my boss? I work directly for the Secretary of Defense. So I am a direct report. My team is all like the 70 folks go to me. I go to SecDef. Now, for those of you who are less familiar with the military, that's really weird, okay? We have all sorts of deputy secretaries and then chiefs of staff of the services and the joint chiefs and all those things. The Secretary of Defense has determined that having a team like this is critical to our national defense and we have that ability. So when someone gets in our way for doing the right thing, that is who I escalate to. And it's a pretty remarkable type of team. Now, we look different than your service folks. Um, so this was an example of, you know, a couple months ago we got together to talk about sort of, you know, DDS has been in play for a few years now. We've done some amazing things. How do we grow more? Um, but this is my team. And we have folks all over the place. And there are certain areas we're growing in right now. Security engineers feels kind of important, right? Um, Real focus, note, blue band, security engineers. Um, data scientists, um, that's an area like, you, you know, I know it's a little sort of out of scope, um, but data science, everyone's talking about AI, ML, analytics, magic dust, all of those different things. And we need to be really smart about how we do it because for the people who have some depth in this area, you know, like with many things, you can do it really well or you can actually do it really poorly. When the stakes are this high, we need to make sure that we do it really, really well. And again, nerds in the room. Um, this is our life. And this is the, the types of missions we do. Um, you have um, 
you know, if you're familiar with the Open Skies program, um, you can Google it at your leisure. You know, this is Jeff on the team, part of the Open Skies initiative. This is a team that's working on a project we call Sabre, um, which is improving the background investigation process. Um, my BFF Owen, we're in Afghanistan together. This is me saying, oh my God, I have gone from open table to a Black Hawk in Afghanistan. Um, and it's actually, it's really comfortable. Like you just sort of settle in, you just make sure those straps are on really tightly. Um, you'll be hearing from Harlan in a minute, who's really doing something interesting there, which I'll defer to him to talk about. Um, but we also try and bring a lot of the spirit to the Pentagon. I'm not sure how many stormtroopers you've actually seen walking in the E-ring um, of the Pentagon, but we have quite a few pretty wild pictures there. Um, now, one of the reasons we're here is part of our portfolio, which I didn't mention before, is what we call the HACTA portfolio. Now, I strongly adhere to the concept of check your work. Now, I can build or write the most amazing software in the world. I still need it to be checked. I can tell everyone in this room, I did my best to secure a system, but it still needs to be checked. Now, historically, um, you, you know, in, in government, we haven't done the best job of security. That's, that's a bummer, okay? So during my tenure as director, it is absolutely critical that every day we uh, raise the bar on this. And this is from writing secure software from day one. Like when someone says to me, oh, we'll check the security once it's, uh, the app's done, that just, I, I have that sort of, well, let's, I don't feel very good about that. Um, you know, the concepts of secure engineering from day one, and it's a continuous process, it's not a checkbox process, but also the concept of embracing the security researcher community and checking our work. So it started as we had hacked the Pentagon, so hacked the website. Um, great, we found lots of stuff and it raised the bar. Now we have things like hack the Air Force, hack the Army. We have all sorts of different things. We actually have a hack the event going on at DEF CON. We have a, a rather big presence at the Aviation Village for those of you who want to play with an F-35 simulator and uh, you can see my mad skills flying. No, not true. Um, you know, we'll be over there. But there's a concept that DOD needs to embrace and I will advocate all day long. We need to embrace the security community. We need to check our work both for public and protected types of entities and be able to raise the security bar. You are our friends. We need to build that trust between the two of us so we do our job better. And by we, we have a series of partners for these bounty events, and that has allowed us to do it. So we, for the public pieces, we have a great process for things that are more secure. They help us to manage the security researchers, have a secure method in, but at the same time, that allows for anonymity. So everyone here can do their part. You have the anonymity. We raise our bar. We both win. So you're going to find that within the DDS portfolio, this is super important. Every day we're doing this battle. Um, Harlan's going to spend a few, time, a few minutes talking about a couple of our different projects we have going. And then as we wind this up, um, we're looking for smart people to help us think about this. Um, whether it's joining some of the efforts for um, doing bounties to learning more about what we're doing. So you are the folks we want to work with. We are the nerds that you will like at the Pentagon. So it can be a really great relationship. But anyhow, let me turn it over to Harlan and he can go from there. Wow, all this applause and I haven't even said anything yet. Um, so Brett talked to you a little bit about kind of what we do and why we do it. And having, I, I just finished my second year uh, here and renewed um, another term. And I've done some work, you know, my, my background is uh, a little hilarious for working in the government. I was, uh, before I was a security architect, but I also worked in the foreign industry, um, which is an interesting transition to the federal government. Um, so I've done a lot of work that I never thought I would 
um, things like this where we uh, built up uh, this project involved uh, electrical engineers and mechanical engineers designing a custom uh, board with an amplifier for troops to carry uh, that will help them uh, deal with um, people dropping grenades on them from, uh, from small drones. This involved uh, doing just a tremendous amount of complicated engineering work, reverse engineering uh, RF protocol, designing the boards, designing the case, testing it in the field. Just a huge amount of really cool work, right? And yes, you will get to do cool things working uh, for DDS. There is cool work to do, but that's not what I'm here to talk to you about. What I'm here to talk to you about is what happens when we're not in the room. What I'm here to talk to you about is this. Uh, this is a visitor management system for a major DOD installation. Uh, the idea being you have a guest, you want to let them into the office, uh, they get escorted into the, the building, they go through security. This is the system that manages that. Um, this uh, system covers two major facilities, one of which is uh, one of the largest DoD installations uh, in the US, and the other one uh, is one of the most sensitive and most protected uh, facilities in the US. Um, this system went live about a year ago now, uh, and in the months going up to it being live, there were all these signs everywhere over the building saying, remember, April 15th, you need to register your visitors in advance. Hey, remember, we're going to not turn them away if you don't register them. So the night it went live, I had some visitors coming the next week. And knowing that obviously all government IT programs work great, I decided it was probably a good idea to register them a little bit early. Uh, so I went, uh, I created a visit, and you know you have all the kind of general information that you might expect. Some weird things that I think are worth pointing out. Um, there's uh, the line, this visitor needs to bring a firearm not something you see on most kind of visitor management systems. It seems a little odd to me. Or how about the visitor is a non-US person. How many people here know the citizenship of all of their friends? It's just like a matter of course. It's like a little weird, but OK, sure, I can, I can deal with that. And then I want you to pay attention to this little box over here. It says, guests, find a guest. This will display all guests that you previously invited. I hadn't previously invited anyone, right? But cool box, you know, uh, I wonder if they like imported people that I've visited in the past, right? So put in a name, get a result, cool. Name, email, and then if you click it, it pre-fills their information and it just reuses the last investigation that they had again, right? And refreshes whatever the data was in between. Perfect, makes total sense. Saves me time, saves them time, everything's great. Uh, but something weird happened when I entered uh, names in there. I noticed that uh, it, was, it was returning names I didn't recognize. Um, like, just random people I'd never heard of. Uh, so I, I asked around the team, like, hey, does anyone recognize you know, Billy Bob? Uh, and they were like, no, no idea who that is. Huh, that's weird. Um, so I. I tried a couple of things, and it very quickly became apparent that what this box was actually doing was not listing this all guests that I have that I previously invited, but rather was listing all guests that anyone had previously invited. Okay, somebody forgot a where clause. Whatever. Uh, so I start looking people up. Right? Who's visited the Pentagon? That might be interesting. Well, you know, Eric Schmidt. He does work. Right? Is his email in there? Oh, yep, it is. Uh, another weird thing about the way that the, the government works is that the DOD and every other part of the government, they all run their ID cards separately. So if you have a DOD badge and you're a White House employee, congratulations, you're a visitor. Right? So you'll notice here, this person, omb at eop.gov, that's the president's um, office. So this is somebody who worked. Um, out of the office of the president. Okay, cool, right? So being a responsible federal employee and an engineer, I did probably what I think most of the people in this room would do. Popped up the, uh, the network terminal and said, okay, well, can I scrape all this data, right? 
Seems cool, right? Uh, so, you know, I look at it, it's like, an, you know, it's the kind of standard as you type in, it's sending its HR requests. Great, right? So, what's the search string? Oh, it's literally just the search string. Okay, seems easy, right? So I can just do AA and then I just start scraping and then I can work my way through the alphabet. No problem. Uh, second thing I noticed, huh. You know, even when you're getting you know, a handful of responses, I think there was like 20 responses in here, 9.3 kilobytes for a name and an email address, that doesn't seem right. That's really weird. What's going on here? Before I advance to the next slide, I should say for the record that the data that you are about to see is all synthetic, and I just generated it yesterday from scratch, because it looks like this. Uh, you'll see some interesting things in here, right? So first of all, you've got name, okay. You've got a UUID, good, UUIDs are great. You've got update time UTC, which is a string of slash date and then the Unix time. Okay, that's a little gross, whatever. You've got their first and last name again, okay, middle name, name suffix, great. Social security number. Huh. That's not good. Uh, investigation, oh great, investigator 4979 did this investigation and this person was approved. Okay, so now, instead of scraping this to get the records of all the people who visited the Pentagon, I get records of all the people who visited the Pentagon and couldn't visit the Pentagon. Okay, still a little interesting. All right, what about this? Here's another person who visited the Pentagon. Oh, what's this? De rejected recent arrest for assault with a deadly weapon. <laughs> huh, okay. So instead, I have this, this application that is giving me their name, their email, their social, right? Who, okay. But also, like, I can just look up at the criminal history of anyone who's visited the Pentagon in the last however long it was, right? Okay, so this is a problem. So we, uh, I called my director, Chris, at the time, um, and said, hey, we've got a little bit of a problem. Uh, we ended up calling the people who owned the system. Uh, I got to say a phrase that I previously thought had only been uh, said in the movies when they said they didn't know how to shut the system down. I said, well, go to the back of the computer and pull all the cords out of it. That should do the trick. <laughs> um, the, the thing that I want to emphasize here, though, is that the people who built this system, the government people who built this system, I'm not so sure about the quality of the engineers who built it, um, they did everything right. They did everything by the books. In fact, when I talked to them later, I found out that this system had actually been supposed to have been launched about six months earlier. But it had been delayed because they needed more time to run security audits on it. Uh, in fact, this application had gone through about a year of security audits. It generated tens and hundreds of pages of audit data, of security processes where they had to document how there were no non-US citizens who had access to commit code to the code base, because God forbid they could put something into the database that would get you to give the records out to that person, and that would be really bad, as opposed to you know giving it to anyone who used the website at all. Um, this process is how the government does security right now, today. Right, so this visitor management system for a major DoD installation, when I say the stakes aren't that high here, what I want you to understand and what I want you to feel in your heart of hearts that when I say leaking the names, socials, and criminal backgrounds of everyone who had visited one of the DoD's largest installations isn't that big of a deal, it's not that big of a deal comparatively. It's a huge deal one-on-one, -on -one, but comparatively, this is small stakes. And this is what the government does on a regular basis. Not because the people who are involved are stupid, not because the people who are involved don't care. Some of the most brilliant people I have met are federal employees struggling in this system that treats them badly, 
gives them no resources, uh, and spends exorbitant amounts of money and time for very little result. Right? The process here is what's broken. The process here is what needs fixing. And the people like the Defense Digital Service, like the United States Digital Service, like 18F, um, there are people who are trying to do the right thing, but we need help. We need help from people like you, both to come and stand where I'm standing, to do this work, to give your time to serve, but also to help us engage the community at large. Right now, the DOD did a thing that no one else in the federal government had done a couple of years ago thanks to the work of our team, which is the DOD created a vulnerability disclosure program. So anyone, anywhere in the world, if they find something in any DOD system, uh, they can report it to us. And as long as they abide by what the industry considers to be responsible disclosure practices, the DOD will not press charges. In fact, they will thank you. And that project is incredible. We get reports from people in all over the world who find vulnerabilities in DoD websites, in DoD systems. They find DoD data where it's not supposed to be, including people in countries whose own governments would pay them very dearly for that information. And instead, they come to us so that we can fix it. Right? That is an awesome uh, amount of responsibility on us. And that is an awesome amount of power that we are putting out into the community to help the government be better, to help us all be safer. Um, to that end, hack the Pentagon, both its sides of bug bounties and vulnerability disclosure uh, are incredibly important programs because no matter how big we grow DDS, Right now it's 70 people, even if we double the team, even if we triple the team, and I hope we do, DOD is one of the largest employers in the United States. It spends a significant portion of the national economy just itself. 100 people is not going to cut it. 200 people is not going to cut it. Right? We need everyone to be working to help here. That's the only way we're going to fix uh, Earhart Zanardi's information from not being leaked uh, yet to yet another unsuspecting website visitor. Thank you. <laughs> the folks have questions? Uh, we'll wait for the microphone. Come to you one second. So do you have any plans or um, are, is, is there anything in the works right now to work with the reservists? I know that you have active duty folks working on it, but it seems like a reservist would have a very good mm -hmm. skill set to, uh, to help with this. We do. We, we have, I think, one or two reservists mm -hmm. on staff right now. Um, there, it can be, because the reservists aren't in full time, Getting them activated to do work can be a little dicey sometimes because of the rules around reservists. Um, but yes, it is definitely something that we're interested in. And if you are or you know somebody who is a reservist and you might be interested, uh, please reach out. Uh, we, can re we can talk to your commands and see uh, if we can come to an arrangement. So in general, like, the, like we like to meet amazing people who want to do things. So I, I like to say, if you're amazing, Reservist, whatever you are, then make it our problem. Like, there's nothing that gives me greater joy than a challenge, and a, you know something like that to make it work. Uh, hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, was your guys' impression of uh, uh, companies like Kessel Run or Futures Command? Uh, do you interact with them? Like, yep. what do you think their odds are for success, etc.? Thank you. So I was out at Futures Command last week. So I met with the CG, the commanding general, and you know we sit down and he gets it. It's just the thing that I'm always encouraging folks is the problem is very large, so let's just pick a couple and deliver on some real things fast. 
Um, so I was impressed with Futures Command. I think it's great what they've set up in Austin. I met some of the what's it, AAL Army Application Lab, and there were some good folks over there trying to you know, tackle some interesting problems. Um, so Kessel Run is really interesting to me. So Will Roper, who's the Assistant Secretary for Acquisitions, is out. So he and I are doing DEF CON together. Um, and Kessel Run is in the portfolio. Um, they are doing. And so I am not going to question anyone for doing. I think we should have a few different approaches going and then always be willing to pull back and say, how can we do it better? But wherever it is, we're going to help foster innovation and try and make it better, but always, it always can be made better. Um, how does the DDS address DOD IT and IA policy deviations in a manner that can be replicated outside of the DDS, like other DOD agencies? Mm -hmm. So that is, that's a really great question. Um, so I'm going to give you two answers, right? I'm going to answer the question you didn't ask, which is how do we deal with it, and then I'm going to answer the question how do we spread that out. So one of the unique powers that DDS has is we have this giant hammer, which is the Secretary of Defense has authorized DDS to waive any DOD policy or regulation that we see fit for the purpose of bringing technology to the Department of Defense. So all the IAA paperwork, all the like bullshit 300 page RMF that does such great work, um, we can just <laughs> toss that stuff out. Um, the, and we, we can and do exercise that, um, that power for other uh, agencies inside the department as well. Um, that's kind of bucket number one, short term. Bucket number two, long term. So uh, our partners uh, in the government have started to understand hey, there's a different way to do things that costs less and gets better results. Like, wow, that sounds interesting. Um, so the Air Force is actually the ones leading this charge right now, especially through some of the work that they're doing with us in Kessel Run. Um, they are working on something called um, Rapid ATO. Uh, so this just came out about uh, two or three months ago. Um, and the concept is that uh, if you document, if you're using an agile development methodology, rather than like taking an, an artifact and then doing an RMF on that artifact, deploying into production, doing a much more development, and like re-auditing, oh, now I've got version 1.3, and doing that work again, um, instead what you approve is you approve the process. You say, I'm going to audit what you have now, and then the process by which you're changing it, and then I'm going to give you what's called a continuous ATO, where you have an ATO, for those of you who aren't, have not been subjected to the brain damage of the federal government yet, ATO, <laughs> authority to operate. Basically, it's a piece of paper signed by somebody saying, yes, you are allowed to use a piece of software, uh, or you are allowed to launch this website, or you are allowed to deploy this missile battery. Whatever it is needs an ATO. Um, that process is something that is definitely being worked on right now. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Hi, thank you both for coming here and for your presentation. I'm a big fan of Hack the Pentagon and the DDS, and I share the word about it everywhere I can. I really appreciate that you are here at B Sides and at DEF CON or Vegas generally. Two quick questions. One, I'm very curious about whether the visitor management system was accessible for persons outside of the Pentagon, or did you require internal network access to, mm -hmm. to view and uh, conduct the research that you did. Second question is, what is at all your attitude towards working with organizations and people outside of the United States, for example, from ally countries as, mm -hmm. such as Israel, where I come from? Thank you very much. So you want to take one, I'll take two. Sure. Um, so the visitor management system uh, that was described there uh, was only accessible, so there were two halves of it. There was the, the half that I showed screenshots of, which is the sponsor side. And that side was only ever accessible to authenticated DoD users from inside of a DoD intranet. Um, the, and and I, I should say it's all been fixed. Uh, it now actually only returns results. They both no longer return the entire database record, and they actually only give you the results for you. Um, they, uh, that they, we did an audit with them to verify that no one had actually collected the information in a substantial way. It was all clean. Um, 
uh, yeah, so that, that part was, th there was not actually a data spill there. Uh, thankfully, we caught it early enough. Um, yeah, so we're very open to working with external partners. So it's, you know, I just got back from Europe a couple of weeks ago where I was meeting with a variety of folks. Um, and then we have, we have, you know, I was over at a series of the embassies. Like, we have a variety of relationships. I think as a community, we all want to do better and get smarter and find the right relationships. Th thank you as well for, for this great presentation. I'm, I'm curious, you're competing with everybody for the shortage of skilled uh, IT and, and security workers. So I'm curious if you are looking at any non-traditional type uh, job positions. I'm thinking part-time job sharing, very short term, maybe 90 day contract projects, uh, you know, and those are just some examples. If, if you have other things that you're doing, I'd be curious, you know, how you're dealing with the shortage of skilled workers in the com uh, competitive environment. So, so I w I'm not sure I completely agree. So I find that when I'm like, I believe in the, I'm gonna go out to some hack night or meetup or something like that and go talk to people. And you, you know, I did one in DC a couple of weeks ago and last night it was like the best thing before you go, you go to bed. I get this LinkedIn message and dude was like, your talk inspired me, I wanna come work. And like, I'm like, okay, I can sleep tonight, that's money. Um, and so I find that when we, so look, if when I was on the outside, there's no way I could know about this amazing group. Like, what are you gonna do? Go to USA Jobs and sort of poke around? Like, like it's just, when, when I sit down and I talk to folks and I'm like, I work with the most amazing people in the room. And there's Harlan, you know, in the back, because I need to point out my folks. I have Roro in the back in the, in the shirt. I have Claire in all the way in the back over there. I, I get to work with the most amazing people that you would find anywhere in the Pentagon or in the DOD. Two, when I tell people, I'm like, yeah, did the whole open table, blah, blah, blah. I gave everything up. I moved my family to DC because this mission is so important. And we need to bring in technical talent to do important things because, you know, like there are people at DOD every day trying their best, like what Harlan was saying. But until the nerds join the party, mm-mm. So I go out and like, and people show up. And so, you know, the core, like, the more I can do that, the bigger our team gets, and I've been so impressed. And we do, for extraordinary circumstances, there's something in the G called an SGE, Special Governmental Employee, where we are able to leverage like certain really niche expertise. But between those two, like we have amazing folks. I just wanna add one more piece on, um, which is that, uh, there are many large companies now offer leave of absences to go do public service work. Um, so I know several of the big like FANG companies now offer the ability to take a one or two year leave of absence from your job uh, and you and be able to come and serve. And, and it, you know, it. Th th I think it's very important to emphasize that this is not a, meant as a career. I don't have enough hair left to survive <laughs> another four years, five years in government, right? It's, just, it's not gonna happen, right? Um, so, and the other side of that coin is that this is not traditional government employment in terms of the hiring process, right? There's still many of the same, unfortunately you will have to register for USA a jobs account, I apologize to everyone in advance, um, but I have no college degree, right? I did not finish college, I dropped out. Uh, I've worked in like the porn industry, I've worked for all sorts of unreputable places, and I'm standing here and I'm, I'm in the government terms, I'm, I'm a GS-15, which is the most senior um, rank in the civil service. Uh, that that uh, would not happen anywhere outside of DDS, right? Like GS-15, oh, you have to have a master's or a PhD, and like blah, 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 blah. So many of those rules we simply can remove um, some of them are trickier, uh, so short-term contracts. Uh, I'm working on the background check system right now for DDS. Sorry, 90 days is, we're, we're not there yet. Uh, right now I think it's, uh, it's like six months. 
Um, so it's very hard for, for very, very short-term contracts for us to get people cleared to come into the door can take a year for a full clearance, less for the interims that we use for people to start. Um, so that, that kind of 90 days is very, very hard. But um, some of our sister teams through USDS will do um, terms as short as one year. So it's, it's an opportunity. If you want to do something completely different, which will be one of the hardest things you ever do for two years, but you will get, like I go back to the, the picture, like not these pictures. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like these are the things you'll do and it'll be super hard, but it'll be super awesome. Yeah. And that's just, and you should only do it for two years. And I can tell you, I will only do it for two years. And then I will go back to zero homicide land and have a timeout. <laughs> but any more or are we? We have time for just a, one or two more questions. Hey, how's it going? So I feel personally like I filled out a lot of DOD forms and I put my social security number on a lot of DOD mm -hmm. forms and forms that really didn't warrant it. Mm -hmm. But there's a spot where and you can't leave it blank. So anyway. I feel like they've made a transition or have started to use the DOD ID number mm -hmm. a little more on those forms. Is that, you think, a viable method for at least reducing the sort of exposure that someone can and the damage that can personally be done to an individual? Or do you think it needs to be taken a step further or integrated more? Or what do you think is a solution to that? Sure. So um, the DOD ID number, Theoretically, it, on paper, the DOD has ordered that social security numbers aren't supposed to be used anymore using the DOD ID number. Um, so far in my two years in government, somebody has asked me for it once. Um, I now have been trained to give my social security number to anyone who asks me. I don't even know who they are. You're just like, oh, I need your social for this. I'm like, here you go. Um, DOD ID numbers also can be interchanged with social security numbers. There's a, a database that will just change them out for you. So you ask it, you give it an EDIPI, which is the term for a DOD ID number. Uh, it'll just give you back a social or vice versa. Um, so like, it is good in that on the back of every single uh, DOD ID and encoded into the barcode, the social security number's not there anymore. Go back 10 years, that was the case. Uh, so anyone who took a photo would have your social security number on it. Uh, that part, great. Uh, in terms of like actually getting rid of the use of the social security number inside the department, we're not there yet. Does having dual citizenship or having someone in your family with dual citizenship prevent you from getting the security clearance you might need? No. no. Thank you. We have time for one last question. All right, thank you thank guys you very much. Thank you.